always have some people trickling through. Um, I don't even need to introduce Pam Tripp. I think all of you know her, love her, recognize her from around the courthouse, from her ladle. Um, so she's here today to present on UCC JEA. Okay, thanks. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, as you probably just heard from the introduction, I'm Pamela Tripp. And um, I think my hire date with Ladle was 10 days before Ladle went live. My hire date was December 20th, 2005. And I got to be part of the original team um, that helped to put this organization together. So it is really nice to be home again, at least for an hour today. Um, we're going to just talk a little bit about the UCCJEA, which everybody knows what it stands for. Uniform Child Custody Jurisdiction Enforcement Act. And it has become more and more what I call kind of an issue du jour um, in the dependency courts. Um, previously um, held primarily to the family law um, courts. And as you'll see, we have a family law code um, that governs the entire UCCJEA. Um, but it's found um, in the 3400 series in the family law code. So hopefully today I've kind of tried to focus um, this just on kind of issue spotting. I know you guys are busy, you have big caseloads, you know, what to watch out for, what to spot, and then to have a little bit of knowledge about the UCCJEA because as a parent's attorney, I can't say that there's any one way of advocacy. You may be looking for a way to advocate for another jurisdiction to take the case. You may be looking for ways to advocate for the California court to take the case, depending on who you represent and what their interests are in the matter. So um, you'll see I don't really present necessarily advocacy tools other than some of the things that you need to do for issue spotting and for creating a good record. So we have quite a few um, published cases in the last few years, and we'll kind of go through some of those near the end. But anyway, we want to promote uniformity between jurisdictions. Um, and that furthers the purpose that, you know, really I think the UCCJEA was born from the situation where you've got maybe one parent or another um, trying to flee to another jurisdiction with a child, right, and then go over there and get better court orders than they had in the prior jurisdiction. They forum shop. Now some of those same issues are kind of coming into play even within the dependency court. So we'll kind of move through some of these. Um, the UCCJEA addresses fundamental jurisdiction. So the term jurisdiction is used in a variety of ways. But basically we're talking about the core power of the court to even make orders or to hear a case. A lack of jurisdiction is the most fundamental um, issue and it has to do with the entire absence of power to hear or determine the case. Now would I suggest that you walk straight into court with a case that looks like maybe the child moved here from another state and tell your judge you have no authority here? That might not be a very good way to approach the case. But remember that that is exactly what we're dealing with here. The judges here have to make the initial determination over whether they even have the power or the authority to hear the case and we're going to talk about some of the ways that that plays out. Um, so the core UCCJEA principle, um, when they say the decree state, this is the original state, whether it's California or another state, that made any kind of custody order regarding a child. It doesn't have to be dependency court order. It can be any family law court order. So that original state keeps exclusive jurisdiction across all filings and all type of proceedings. This is your starting point. All other courts are barred from modifying that custody order um, for any kind of final custody determination. So that's what we call exclusive and continuing jurisdiction. So how does that state um, relinquish or lose their jurisdiction? Well, there's a couple of ways that that can be done. And it's found, again, in the 3400 series of the Family Law Code. If the decree state finds it no longer has a significant connection um, and that substantial evidence no longer exists in the state, um, the decree state or another state finds that all children um, and parties no longer reside in the state, excluding temporary absences. I'm going to look because I have made a few notes about that. 
Um, also, if the decree state finds itself to be an inconvenient forum and relinquishes jurisdiction, I'm going to, this probably should have been two or three slides later, because I'm going to go back to this and tell you how this kind of played out in a couple of the cases that I was involved in under the UCCJEA recently in the dependency court. But the decree state can also relinquish juris jurisdiction um, <coughs> if they choose to do so. Now, one of the ways, and the really only way, that uh, California Dependency Court can take um, and make detention orders about a child when that child is the subject of a sister state custody order is under <coughs> temporary emergency jurisdiction only. And that has been um, defined, finally, through some of the case law that we have um, as only on an emergency basis can the court make orders. So in our world, that means the court can make those detention orders on a temporary basis pursuant to 34, um, 24 of the Family Law Code. But you want to prevent the case, if you're trying to enforce that sister state judgment, you want to prevent the case from going to the adjudication disposition hearing because that's really where the court actually takes subject matter jurisdiction over the parties, right? We all know that, correct? I think so. So, if you want to look and see if California has emergency jurisdiction, yes, if a child is here in this state, well, let's go back, I'm sorry. First of all, you want to be able to determine as best you can from the record and the detention, so the social worker's detention report, whether or not maybe that child is the subject of a sister state custody order. It's not like the social workers are going to know and they're going to go, oh, you know, there's a Louisiana judgment for this child. But you want to look for if there's any kind of social history or through the interview process with the parent. Sometimes you'll pick it up and you'll be able to do that issue spotting. And then you can ask your client, right? if, um, you know, get a little bit more of the detail and more of the history. I think one of the other ways that it plays out here quite a bit is because, you know, we're kind of a border with Mexico. And so that is really where it comes up very commonly is that there, there may have been um, issues with UCCJEA, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But anyway, did that state or nation have jurisdiction under the UCCJEA criteria. So if you can spot that issue in your detention report, then it's time for you to dig your UCCJEA notes out and dig in a little bit deeper. So emergency court jurisdiction is available when the court of this state finds that the subject uh, child is present in this state, has to be present in this state, and that the child has been, sorry about the typo, the child has been abandoned or is subject to or threatened with mistreatment or abuse. So again, this is family law code. It's not the Welfare and Institutions Code. So the language doesn't parallel our language in the dependency court exactly, but it's the same idea. If a child is at risk, we call it, we, everything's focused on risk and dependency. If the child's at risk, then the court can intervene and make emergency orders. Um, they are down on the third or fourth bullet point. They're supposed to only take emergency jurisdiction long enough and to determine what period of time they need in order to resolve that emergency. So you've got a little bit of other tools that maybe you can go forward with because all we really need under the UCCJEA is to resolve that issue. Maybe we're gonna send the child back to the state that had that. Maybe there's one parent here and one parent there. You have to do the analysis of your case on those issues. So once the court here, um, once the court here in California has a petition in front of them and they've been informed, how are they going to be informed? They might be informed by the department, but more likely, they're going to be informed by you. You may have a client who's sitting out in the hallway telling you, wait, 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 as I had once. Yes, I know I live here with my child, but the father is in Louisiana, and we have an open custody case there that he filed because we lived there our whole married life, and I came here with the child, and that court has already made orders. So now we, I'm the one informing the court that there's a UCCJEA issue because I have a state of Louisiana 
which has already issued custody orders, and there's an open, active, contested hearing set in that state in whatever time frame it was, the next month or something like that. So once the state, the court here is informed, and some of you may have been through this, you know what's the next trigger, right? The judge here, the court here, has to contact the court in the sister state. And I put a little note at the bottom. When you look at the case law summaries, I think these were all handed out, there are some cases that deal with this note in a little bit more detail. And so if you have this issue come up, um, I suggest that you maybe take a, a look closer at that case. But as a general rule, I think you're on safe ground if you prevent the case, if that's in your client's best interest, of course, prevent the case from proceeding to the jurisdictional hearing until the UCCJEA issues are completely resolved. The UCCJEA states there is to be an evidentiary hearing on the jurisdictional issue before our petition is even resolved. So it's, all, it's up front. Um, there's no requirement that it be in writing. There's just a requirement that you inform the court. And that issue needs to be resolved before anything more than just emergency temporary orders are made. So, family law section 3421, um, this is required for a court to make an initial custody determination. Um, if for some reason the other state declines ongoing jurisdiction and cedes jurisdiction to California, the California court is still to make a record and make some findings on the record, okay? Um, they have to find that California is the home state or that there is potentially no home state of the child meaning that the child hasn't resided in either of the states for a period in excess of six months. Um, the court needs to find here that there's a significant connection to California, that there's substantial evidence, right, about the nature of the case and what are the allegations are in California, and all the states, I, and I said or nations, because the UCCJEA applies exactly the same for sister state judgments as it does to other countries. Okay, so it's other states or other countries. So all the other states that had a claim to jurisdiction have declined jurisdiction in favor of California um, or that no state would have jurisdiction under the UCCJEA criteria. You all are so quiet. Can I ask a question about that last slide? Yes, you have a furrow in your brow. Can, you, can you go back to it? Yeah. <coughs> so um, number five, let's uh -huh. say, all states with a claim to jurisdiction have declined jurisdiction, mm -hmm. but there's not really that. There's not really a substantial connection, and maybe there's very little evidence in California. Does this court still have the ability to take jurisdiction over the child if they believe the child's at risk? Yeah, I believe that they do because if you don't have another state, either even if there's a custody order in another state, it's not automatic that that state is going to take the child back and have jurisdiction there. So you'll see through some of the case law that if that other state doesn't actively take steps to, you know, take the child back in, in, into the state and make those custody determinations and jurisdictional decisions, then California can take jurisdiction over the child. Thanks. Okay. Okay, as a timeout for a peek at some definitions. So um, home state, you'll hear the attorneys uh, talking about home state. So that means a state with, that the child has lived in for at least six consecutive months, um, immediately before the commencement of the child custody proceeding. So it says in this code section that in a case of a child that's less than six months of age, um, then it would be the state where the child has lived from birth to whatever age the child is under six months. However, are there ever any exceptions to the rule? Yes. We do have a published case out of dependency, NRA RL, and this is in your case summary materials. It's from the year 2016, and it states that a brief stay in the hospital incident to birth does not confer jurisdiction for purposes of the UCCJEA. 
In Ray RL was a San Diego County case, and it probably comes up a lot more because that is a border city. And this was a case where a mom came over the border nine months pregnant and gave birth in a San Diego hospital and, you know, was not legal here, and she tested positive for meth, okay? However, the court in uh, Ray RL found that because the child, the mother, the father, and the um, were both citizens of Mexico, and they found that the UCCJEA applied, and that that was not sufficient connection, ties, and everything to California, and so they found that California, even though the child was born here, did not have home state per the definition under 3402. If you're geeky enough to want to know all the reasons why, then you have to read the case. <laughs> so um, then we have the commencement of the proceedings means the filing of the first pleading in a proceeding. Can I ask you a question about that last thing? Uh-huh. Sorry. About that or about the RL case? Sort of RL. So in that case, because California wasn't the home state, it, re it would have required California to contact Mexico and see if they wanted jurisdiction, correct? Yes. That's the way that it would flow. Okay. Right. So like I said, it depends on who you're representing, you know. Sometimes we know that we have clients that come over the border because they want the medical care services and they want, you know, those kinds of things here. But, right, it's a two-edged sword in a situation like that, you know. Is it be in the best interest of your client to get involved and advocate for the child to get sent back to Mexico, maybe with a father or, you know, whatever the orders are going to be or get Mexico to do that? Or would you rather be advocating, you know, that the child stay here? Either way, you need to look at the case of Inray RL and try to figure out if there's a way to do it. But if Mexico declines, then California can take it. Correct. If Mexico declines, then California can take it. I have a follow Go ahead and try and get a hold of the courts over there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's you know that's where it takes it takes a lot of legwork on these cases if you're gonna really get involved and do it. If we have time, I'll share a couple things that I've encountered, but um, anyway, yes, Rachel. To follow up on Jason's question, if the court was able to get a hold of Mexico, Mexico says, nope, we don't want jurisdiction, take it. Mm -hmm. Does this court then have to make that analysis you were talking about previously and find, yes, there's a significant connection, yes, there's evidence here in order to be able to take it? I would suggest to you that the answer to that is yes, and here's why. Because when the record is silent, Okay, and that is exactly what happened in later in the, the materials, you'll see the In Ray Aiden L case that came down, I think last year in 2017. And they did reverse the trial court on the UCCJEA issue, why? Because the record was silent as to findings. And that case is still in litigation and being bounced. It just got bounced from Arizona back to California and I represent one of the parties in that case um, and so it can be a real mess. So the answer is yes. To the extent that you possibly can, you have to ask for those findings and orders on the record. And part of what you're doing is making your record for appeal so that you know the court has considered it and the court is making those findings. You know, the more detailed, the better, right? Understanding, like I said, I don't live in a, you know, in a, not, in a place where I don't understand how heavy the caseloads are and the courts have million cases on calendar, but to the extent that you can, you encourage the court to make that record. Okay. I'm actually going to skip that one. It kind of repeats in my opinion. Um, now, a temporary, like we've already <coughs> talked about, this just kind of reaffirms that temporary jurisdiction can ripen into full um, subject matter jurisdiction if the other form does not act for six months. That's another one. I don't know if some of you are in courtrooms that your adjudication disposition hearings are regularly going out this far, but I assure you, there are some, you know, some of you may be in courtrooms that that's not happening, but I can assure you there are courtrooms where that is happening. So I would suggest to you that if it's in your client's best interest, you know, maybe, like I said, you're going to be advocating, right, for Mexico or Louisiana or whatever it is you know, to take the child back and to take over the case, or you might be in a situation where you want the child to stay here, you've got a custodial parent, and you just want to stay under the radar for six months, you know? Yes? Is there any legal basis that you're aware of that the court can acquire jurisdiction over a child who's not present in the state, and there are no prior custody orders from the other state? 
There is no way that I know of to do that. Um, in fact, I just had that happen in a case where um, there had been a safety plan and an investigation, but no court filing. And both parents had signed a safety plan and agreed that the child would move away from mother here and go to the father in Maryland. The social worker flew the child to Maryland, gave the child to the father with a letter. Everybody agrees, the father's got custody, now you can make all the decisions. Mother was in a mental hospital. And when she got out, she wants her child back, you know. And um, the department refused to file and release the child to the father in Maryland. Why? Because under the UCCJEA, if the child is not present in this state, they can't file a petition. And the UCCJEA says, for a court to take any action, the child has to actually be here. Now, if the child was here, and if you're talking about a situation, there are some cases where they fled the jurisdiction, but that's where they were California residents to begin with. That's a separate situation. I don't know if that's what you were thinking about. No, I'm talking about more of a circumstance where there was an investigation, they had been living in California, but then they decided to move a month prior to the filing of the petition mm -hmm. to permanently relocate in another state, and then the department filed the petition. So you, what that case, I believe, is going to be is it's going to turn on the facts. You know, did they go back to a state where they lived before and where the child lived, where you could trigger the UCCJEA, or were they just fleeing the jurisdiction? You see, you're going to have to argue the facts of that case to see if you can even trigger the UCCJEA. You have to look at how long the child lived here and how long the child has lived there. What happens sometimes is, um, like I said, depending on the facts and the timeline, Sometimes DCFS then will just call in a referral to the CPS in that other state and let the, that state investigate, you know, so it, it's really going to turn on the facts of the case. I hope that answers your question. There was another hand? Yeah. Um, so are you saying that if, if California takes emergency jurisdiction and then through the course of the court trying to contact that other state that had home state jurisdiction that California could actually ripen to home state within if it takes them six months it yes it can ripen to home state and there are some case summaries in here which state that if the decree state or the original you know uh, custod state that made the original custodial orders does not take action to respond and the time clock runs that is a way that California, that we can ripen to full jurisdiction here. Okay. okay. And by, sorry, if I take action, is it enough for our court to talk to the judge and the other court and they say, yes, we want it, would that be considered taking action or do they actually have to calendar something? No, that would, that would be that enough. Would I mean, that would be enough is for the court to say, that they are, they intend to take jurisdiction and, and they're going to take action to do it. It might take um, longer for the machinations of it, but as long as they right. articulated it, that right. Would that. I mean, logistically, you know, somebody's got to pick up the child and things have to, you know, be done. But that's kind of really more on DCFS to take those actions. Hold on, Jason. There's okay. a hand behind you. Yeah, so in a particular case, I, I saw we had um, the home state, which I think might have been Nevada willing to take it, jurisdiction, but the child was AWOL, she was run away. And the court would not, in Nevada, would not take the case until the child was located and brought back to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the court here was trying to say, well, we can't provide to the child. If you're taking jurisdiction, you take jurisdiction. And the court said, we will, but we're not countering the case or anything until this child's located. Mm -hmm. So, And the judge here uh, was a little perplexed. And I'm curious about what your what yeah, you know, I mean, my immediate, immediate reaction without having some of my think time would be that the court here would probably have the authority to issue a protective warrant and just wait it out. You know, um, I think then it just has to, you have to see how the case plays out. You know, do they find the child and bring them in before like that six month period runs? Um, where California then could just kind of subsume, but once Nevada has indicated they take the case, I'm not sure that six-month timeline would even apply. It's like if you get your hands on the child, subject matter, right, and Nevada wants the child, then you can send the child back. Yeah. Um, I just want to um, clarify, so if there's, if there's no previous custody action, like the parents live in Arizona, but they went camping out here for one day and drugs were found and the DCFS got involved, DCFS or the, the juvenile court doesn't have to contact the Arizona court because there was no prior custody determination, right? 
Well, that's very interesting that you say that. And the way that I'm reading the case law, and I'm telling you, I really do feel like this is a developing field because I thought that very same thing. And it came up in the Aiden L case where, you know, the court, okay, so the Court of Appeal reversed the trial court and said you didn't make UCCJEA findings and it does not look like there was home state, the parents were not here for six months and all of that. So they, it was remanded for an evidentiary hearing, but the Court of Appeal says the, um, it looked like the California court, was, it was incumbent upon them to contact the um, Arizona court to see if there was an open case or if they would take the case. And there was no open case at that time on this child. There had been an open case on siblings. Um, and so my reading of Aiden L is that they still have to contact that jurisdiction and ask the court if they would like to initiate, initiate a custody proceeding. Yes? Um, well, two points. The first is when I looked at the code, I thought it said they may contact the other state if there's no prior custody, but that it's not a requirement. So, we would basically just be pulling out the case law if we want. You could, I, you know, I understand what you're talking about in the code section. There seems to be, you know, that kind of permissive, not mandatory language. But if you read the case law on that, you will see that it is regularly treated as a mandatory as a mandatory, that they must contact that jurisdiction that has a, an, an initial custody order. Okay, and then I understand, it's my understanding that UCCJEA is an issue that cannot be waived. Um, should our attorneys be raising this at every hearing, at the arraignment detention, at the, at the jurist disco, um, if there's a PRI, raise, I mean, should we be raising it at every Hearing? Like any, like my suggestion would be like any other issue, when you have to make a record, you know, you should be raising it until the issue is resolved, okay? So once you see CJEA issues, they may be resolved. You can also identify it as an appealable issue, but you should definitely be bringing it up at every hearing. And I'm telling you, the judges, in my opinion, are still a little bit all over the place on this. And I think the judges are really, a lot of them, they're honestly trying to deal with it. But this is not like a fully, fully well-settled area in dependency law. So um, that's why we're doing the training and that's why we're trying to hash these things out. So, okay. So I gave a little bit uh, of a summary here on the Aiden L case, which we just talked about. But this was one, and I just put it up here as an example because probably almost everybody here could relate to reading a detention, or, uh, detention report that said like this. The detention report stated that the parents and the minor had traveled to California from Arizona about four months before the dependency petition was filed. Um, so this was one where um, the record was silent. There was no one that spoke up about the UCC JEA issue. And so everybody kind of conceded that California, because they weren't here six months, was not the child's home state when the petition was filed. Yet for unexplained reasons, the issue of subject matter jurisdiction it's a little bit snobby of the Court of Appeal to make a comment like that, wouldn't you say? You know what I mean? Like, as if we're all in court asleep at the wheel on purpose, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm defending you guys that way, okay? It's like, oh, excuse me. Um, anyway, I don't know why they say for unexplained reasons. I could think of a hundred reasons why anybody could miss this, right? Anyway, uh, okay, no further commentary. Um, I know you guys are overworked. Anyway, so the juvenile court, um, when it initially detained the minor, when it made the jurisdictional findings and subsequent child custody orders, it went all the way through that. And I gave a little shout out to your, your predecessors, Jesse McGowan um, and Landon Villavaso. There were two appellate attorneys because one of them represented the biological mother who was trying to get the case back to Arizona, and the other one represented the two siblings who lived in Arizona and were trying to get this younger child placed back. So Aiden L., the case was reversed. And I just highlighted that again because um, although they could be snobby and critical, now that we know, like once you know, now we have to watch out for this issue, right? Okay, so we have the case of Inray MM. There's no statutory authority that expressly provides a court has an affirmative obligation. That's a little bit of the permissive versus mandatory language um, that she might be speaking about. But also, it's really not up to the court to find this issue and to say, okay, they don't have a duty to say, okay, everybody come in, let's all have a little conference with the judge about the UCCJEA. 
the courts have no obligation really to do that. So they don't have to advise like we give ad ad admonitions and advisement of rights to the parties. There's no requirement that the court advise them of their rights under the UCCJEA. So it really is up to you to do the issue spotting and then as soon as you don't know what to do, call your supervisor. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> Uh, some final notes about this um, before we get into a little bit of the case summaries. Remember, the UCCJEA is the exclusive authority to resolve the issues of jurisdiction between the states. The home state has exclusive jurisdiction unless that court concedes that it's not going to take jurisdiction. Hint, I suggest that the conversation between bench officers be taken down by a court reporter. Mm -hmm. There is some support for this, and honestly, I can't remember if it's in the code or a published case I read, um, but I went through this with a certain judge who shall remain uh, nameless in Department 419. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we go through the whole thing with this UCC JEA issue, right? He dutifully contacts the judge in the other state <coughs> And because I am a complete maniac, right, with my cases, I already have contacted a lawyer in the state of Louisiana who had the family law case, who walked it into that court and made sure that they told that judge to take jurisdiction back again because that court had given my client custody and the chance of your client being having the children detained in 419 is high, right? <laughs> and um, so when we came back, um, the judge said, yes, I've contacted that judge, and he wants to take the case back. And I can't remember how it got set ahead again or continued. And when we came back for trial, the judge said, I said, but Your Honor, the Louisiana court said they're going to take this under UCCJEA. And he said, well, I don't think that's exactly what the judge meant. Oh, I'm not kidding. That's exactly what I dealt with there. So we took it all up on appeal, and that's kind of another story. But there is authority. You can ask, no matter if you're going to make your judge mad, I don't know, you have to you know, measure your own bench officer. But when they call, you have the right to have that on speaker phone in chambers and either be present, but I would suggest you may want to consider actually having the court reporter take down the conversation. Now, that was just one experience anecdotally that I had with a judge who just like literally put something opposite on the record the next time and we'll let the appellate attorneys, what could I do? I have to let the appellate attorneys sort that out. But there is a case um, which now has dealt with, right, because I'm a dinosaur for sure, and um, there was a case where now some of the judges are utilizing email. So if they can get the email address of the judge in the other jurisdiction, they can email it. Now you've got a written record that you can track, right? So. This was a case, there was a published case, it's in your materials, let me see if I can tell you which one. Um, it was Mexico, I don't think it was another state, but they emailed that court several times, two or three times, and over the course of several months, um, the court in Mexico never responded to the emails, and the Court of Appeal decided that that was enough effort, and it was up to the Mexican, the jurisdiction in Mexico to take some initiative and take the case and with that you know um, track record in the emails that email communication was deemed sufficient under the UCCJEA there's no requirement that it be a telephone call that's why I'm bringing it back to you like us dinosaurs that's normally the way we would all we see this done but not so much anymore it can be an email and so I leave that up to you also because you can ask the court to provide copies of those email transmissions to all of the attorneys and make sure they're lodged in the record. You know, you can make your record that way. But if that jurisdiction doesn't respond, and I'm sure all of you don't have time to be chasing all these other jurisdictions down and getting lawyers in there, you know, to, to try to do what you want to have them do, um, at least make sure you've got your record made. So, um, let me just see real quick. I have a question about that, Pam. Yep. Um, up in the fabulous world of Lancaster, I'm familiar. Um, Commissioner Padilla uh, was asked and agreed to contact an elusive bench officer who was nameless in a department that was unknown in a county in Nevada that wasn't Las Vegas and see if they wanted jurisdiction. So 
as a former bench officer, can you tell me how you would have accomplished finding that person? Or should I just accept that every reasonable effort was made? Because, of course, nothing came of it. Right, so was the bench officer telling you that they tried and they couldn't figure it out? Was that your situation? Yes, but it was kind of vaguely worded with the tone of don't F with me today. <laughs> yes, well, like I said, we all have different personalities on the bench or whatever, but you know, having looked through these cases and look at the kind of records that we have to make, um, I think that it's fair for you to you know, see if you can get some kind of a verification on that. I mean, really with the internet now and the way that you can search for courts and jurists, they all have websites. I, you know, I would think maybe what happened then wouldn't happen today because it's not as difficult to find, you know, the court. You look up the, the city, the zip code, and figure out where they all lived. And I mean, you can kind of do that through a pretty simple internet search now. So Is that I think that's what delegated to the clerk? Well, I don't know of any case law that speaks to that, that that issue actually has been ferreted out. You know, it, it, the court has the duty, so I don't think there's a problem with the court delegating that to their clerk if they need help with some of that. I mean, I don't know of any law that would prevent that. I know that the code says the court, they just use the term the court. So it's not necessarily the duty of the attorney or DCFS or the DCFS at County Council, it's the court's responsibility. It's your job to ask the court to do it, right? To bring the issue to the attention of the court, to say we have a factual scenario here where I think the UCCJEA is triggered, Your Honor, and just you know get something on the record that way, and you can trigger at least that they've got to take some action. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And over coffee, some other time, we'll talk about nasty bench officers. <laughs> yeah? You were saying you have a right to be present during the conversation between the bench officers. Does that come through statute or through case law? Um, that's a very good question. I think that that's just through case law when you talk about the, when you see some of these cases about the way that the situation is handled. And I, you know, I think that where I come from is a basic due process place. I'm not talking about that there's actually a UCCJEA published case. Okay, but there's nothing wrong with you asking the court if the court's going to make that call, if the attorneys can all come into chambers and listen to the call. That's one. You can ask that. Number two, you could just ask because the court maybe is going to call after court's done for the day or, the, you know, everybody's gone. There's certain scheduling things. You can ask the court to please have the court reporter present talk to the judge on speakerphone and have it transcribed. That's what you'll see more when you look through some of these cases. But you can ask to be present. I think the transcript is even better, my, and that's just my opinion, than even the attorneys being present, because we all write our notes down and then everybody fights about what their notes say later, and you know what I mean? Um, so those are just strategic decisions as an attorney that you have to make. I'm just trying to put options on the table for you, okay? Yeah. And, and just to, I just looked at the code. The code does require, in fact, that a court reporter be present or that the... the that it be waived? Yeah, I didn't look that up before I did this, but I had seen it. Or that communication be recorded. Mm -hmm. And if it's emailed, then it's supposed to be printed out, so it has to be recorded. Right. But these are things that you guys need to know. Like I said, you need to be asking for these things to make sure they're on the record. We don't necessarily want to see an Aiden L case come up again. Nobody really wants, I mean, come on. This kid is four years old now and was detained at a couple of months old and we still don't have jurisdiction resolved because it all started with a record that was silent. No attorney brought it up. So we don't necessarily want to see that happen. It's probably not in anybody's best interest. So um, I encourage you to, you know, get these things on the record and make your record as best you can. Let's see. <coughs> Oh, my note in, in Ray Aiden L. So I just wanted to let you guys know in that case, just as if this isn't complicated enough, Judge Jaskell did a multiple day evidentiary hearing. I mean, not the whole day, but you know, it went multiple witnesses testified on the evidentiary issue only as to UCCJEA when this was reversed on appeal. And she did a 18 or 20 page written decision and made the conclusion, went through all the analysis that we had about home state and why did the parents come and what was their intention in coming and did they intend to stay, did they not intend to stay. She had a full evidentiary hearing, right? 
and came to the conclusion that Arizona, sh that the case was not belonging to California, that it should go to Arizona. Of course, me and Landon and Jesse are going crazy. We got attorneys over there. We got them to open up. Guess what? Attorneys in Arizona can file private dependency cases. Mm -hmm. Completely foreign to us. If I didn't make the call, I never would have known. They opened up a case in Arizona. The judge there is all ready to take the case. The judge in Arizona takes the case and says, I think California decided this case completely wrong. We're going to have our own evidentiary hearing on UCCJEA, and the decision just came down last week, and they declined jurisdiction after a multiple-day evidentiary hearing, multiple witnesses, and said we're declining based on inconvenient forum. Oh and now the case is coming back. It is not resolved yet, and it has been four years. So anyway, just thought I'd give you that little anecdotal note. So they can blow up ridiculously, but it's like, full employment for attorneys. <laughs> That is the end of that. So these materials um, that are the case summaries, how am I doing on time? Not bad, not bad. Um, uh, these are materials, oh first I should say, just to keep myself covered, um, a lot of the materials on the UCCJEA um, I took with permission from a family law attorney that like wrote the CEB practice guide. Her name is Leslie Shear, and her materials are printed with her permission. And the packet of case summaries that have been handed out, the page numbers are funny because this is just excised out of the California Appellate Project. So these are their case summaries. And you can kind of see, looking through here, um, that UCCJEA has become, in, it's, we're getting there. There's case law that's coming out. It's getting to be a better developed sense, uh, a better well-settled area of the law. But I believe we are not there yet, OK? So you're going to find yourselves walking into factual situations where you may not find a dependency case that absolutely speaks to your issue. But you've got a um, pretty good amount of cases now that are going to give you a good foundation and a good basis for what you need to do in any factual scenario. Yeah, Amy. One of the things I think is interesting about UCCJ, and it came up on one of Jacqueline's cases, that the case law is different in the other states mm -hmm. on the UCCJA issue. So she oh had a case gosh. where the judge was saying that they could, that California could adjudicate the petition mm -hmm. and then send the case after the petition. In other words, that their state was not a convenient forum for the juris, for the adjudication issues, but they wanted the kid back. And and allegedly there was some case law, and I think it was what Port Oregon. Yeah, it was in Oregon. And and what they were saying is is that it. Family Code Section 3412 in, in the Family Law Code allowed for us to conduct an evidentiary hearing, send a certified copy of the transcripts to their um, jurisdiction for them to then conduct the disposition hearing. So our court only made factual findings. Right. Um, and then sent a certified copy of all minute orders and the transcripts to that other jurisdiction. And I've actually been able to do that in Oregon and Nevada. Mm -hmm. No one's taken it up yet mm -hmm. um, that, I, that I'm aware of. And didn't yeah. they claim that there was some case law in Oregon that allowed in, them yeah, to Yeah, in Oregon, that, the so bench officer so there said that she had gotten mm -hmm. spanked on the issue for not doing that. And so that was her request to our court yeah. was to conduct that kind of evidentiary hearing. And then our court mm -hmm. has then done it on two or three other occasions. So, right, and I think that's very interesting to me too because I think what you'll find, you know, like I said, I'm giving you my best from all that I've learned about this issue, being through it up on appeal a few times, is there could be the development of case law in that state that might be giving instructions that certain issues are handled a little differently, but I can tell you when it comes to the statutes, there is to be uniformity between all 50 states. Okay, obviously another country is not necessarily going to have the same statutory, but these are supposed to be statutes that are adopted uniformly by all 50 states. But it stands to reason, just thinking it through, that that could happen, that other states have sort of, you know, maybe they have developed their case law a little better about the way these things are handled and, you know, the remanding cases with specific, like in our jurisdiction, Aiden L. came down from our Court of Appeal with very specific instructions for what the trial court should do with the evidentiary hearing, and so I could see where that would be true. And it's in our family law code that we can, at the re we can request another state or another state can request us to conduct an evidentiary hearing and send those transcripts, 
And I feel like if, if you're advocating for the position of getting the case out of your jurisdiction, and if the court is on board with that, which our court usually is, he doesn't want another case, he can offer that as a like middle ground, like, oh, mm -hmm. the facts happen here, so we'll do this evidentiary hearing, and then you take it, you know, because that's the that's the home state. You know? Right, right. Though, no, I'm glad that you shared that. I think that, yeah, you'll find that a lot of these are going to morph into different kinds of situations, you know, as you go through them. Um, anyway, so like I said, on this case law, um, there are, there is one case in here that I looked through the summary on. It wasn't a case that I was involved in, but it was kind of interesting to me because they went through and tried to do some kind of an analysis about this issue as to whether we can have just a detention hearing, you know, or whether you can actually go to the jurisdictional hearing, but just call it a temporary emergency jurisdictional hearing and, you know, make those kinds of findings. And so I think there's a little bit of a split of authority here on some cases that say they can only make, a, you know, to me, emergency detention, it's one thing. We don't really call that a jurisdictional hearing, but the Court of Appeal here said, well, it kind of is. You know, it is jurisdictional in a sense. So I don't find that case particularly helpful, but you'll see the summary in here if you get into that kind of a situation where maybe you have a judge that wants to press through. They always want to keep their timelines going and they want that jurisdictional hearing to get done, right? Um, and so, you know, they kind of want to press on through, but you're trying to give that pushback and say, look, it's a UCCJEA, we can't get there yet. Um, hope you can, I think that case could kind of be argued either way, so. Anyway, any other questions? Yeah. yeah so, again, back to temporary emergency jurisdiction. So, at like a detention hearing, the court's authority to make any orders concerning a child, do those, is that conferred through either continuing an ongoing jurisdiction from a prior custody order in that, in that state? or temporary emergency jurisdiction? No, the orders here would be made under the temporary emergency jurisdiction under 3424 of the Family Law Code. And that is what confers on the judge. And they just have that one broad statement, if, the child, if there's been a maltreatment of the child or an abandonment of the child, that's the language they use. But really, it's 3424 that confers emergency temporary jurisdiction on the California court if the child's here in what I would call at risk. Right, but both so, predicated on the child being present in the state. Correct? Predicated on the child being present in the so state. So how does the court get any authority if a petition is filed after the child is no longer present in the state mm -hmm. to make any orders? Okay, now, like I, I think that you're going back to the case. The yeah. way that I'm kind of analyzing that was the factual situation. If there's a child that's a subject of an investigation here mm -hmm. and they flee the jurisdiction to another state like where they never lived before or where they haven't lived for years or certainly for more than six months, honestly, I do think the court can make um, issue the protective custody warrant and make temporary orders if the child is outside not, the jurisdiction. What if they're not asking for removal? Well, that's weird. <laughs> Why wouldn't they be? Asked? Exactly. DCFS well, says we lost him, but we're not really bothered by it. But here's the paperwork anyway. So that seems kind of odd. I don't know about that. But like I said, I think it's a matter of whether they're fleeing this jurisdiction because they're being investigated, or whether, like, did they go to Ohio and that's where they lived no, before, and there was an Ohio judgment? State. A prior essentially would be a home state. Okay. So um, what was the timeline? Say they lived in the state of California. Uh, couch surfing for approximately 13 months mm -hmm. and then a four-month investigation was going on it was closed as unfounded they moved to uh, Nevada about a month prior 28 days prior to the filing of the petition um, and then the department files a petition I don't see it I think that case should go up on appeal I mean right. I don't so, see but the, the court having is the, the temporary emergency jurisdiction right Right, it would be. You want to see what does the department have as the risk? If they investigated the case and closed it as unfounded, why would they file on it? Right, Was so it? if there's not even temporary emergency jurisdiction, I understand that the general subject matter jurisdiction cannot be waived, but if there's a question under this circumstance, does it require a special appearance or anything to that Definitely nature? a special appearance. And I mean, this is just me as an old dog thinking that what you're talking about and some of the other old dogs here can say, that's like something I think that maybe is a demur. You know what I mean? Did they even allege something in the petition that's actionable? 
you know, and just like what you need, more things to write and research and all of that. But I mean, that's given the facts that you're giving me, I'm thinking like that's just kind of a demur. You know, you could certainly trigger the UCC JEA maybe to say that you know if that it was a sincere, like they sincere, they had a sincere belief that the investigation was closed and they went back to the state they lived in for many years. I mean, that, that's where you argue the facts, but. I'm not really seeing temporary emergency jur I'm not seeing any jurisdiction right. in that case. Okay. Appeal. That's my final thought. Appeal. <laughs> Full employment for all the appellate lawyers. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> anyway, anybody else? That's about what I have for material. I mean, there's stuff here, but I'm not going to read it to you. Mm -hmm. I hope everybody has found it at least somewhat helpful trying to sort this out. Um, stay tuned, because I have no question in my mind that we're going to be having more development of the case law in this area. It's a hot topic now. <laughs> Thank you.